ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ted Thomas and I am privileged to be the chair this evening. I must ask for your patience. This evening's proceedings are going out live to over a thousand people, but they're not ready to take the live coverage as of this moment. So it has been decided that I will fill in <laughs> for five minutes or so. Something I've been doing all my life. Investigative journalist 
are beyond question. It has, had, it has been suggested that I briefly address the vexed question whether Nicky Hager was justified in using the hacked or stolen material handed to, to him by his source. Hacking is not only a crime, but an invasion of privacy. I have given the issue considerable thought. It's an ethical question, and so there will be scope for difference. It is my hope that the question is capable of being approached and dealt with in a more measured way than has been the case with commentary in the media. As a general rule, the use of hacked or stolen material and the invasion of privacy is wrong, but few rights, if any, are absolute, and few principles, if any, are absolute. They must ultimately submit to the overriding public interest. The decision as to whether or not the public interest should prevail necessarily falls to be determined by the individual who would publish the material. And because that individual has an interest in utilizing the material, it is not disputed that he or she is under an obligation to be responsible and ethical in arriving at their decision. The media adopt this approach and at times invoke the public interest to justify the publication of material that is private. Members of Parliament invoke the public interest to justify using parliamentary privilege to expose something or somebody when they deem it in the public interest to do so. So in this case, in Nicky Hager's case, it's a matter of balancing the principle that one should not utilize hacked or stolen material or invade a person's privacy against those considerations that might or do make up the public interest. And having undertaken that exercise, I am of the firm opinion that in this case, the public interest prevailed. And these are the considerations I would quickly list. First, few would dispute that it is vital in a democracy that deviant political practices be exposed, whether it is the withholding of information from the public, as in the Seeds of Distrust in 2002, or the exposure of political machinations and shenanigans as in the hollow men and dirty politics. In any sort, if any sort of morality is to infuse politics, it is in the public interest that it may be made plain to politicians that political ends do not justify the means. Secondly, accountability of politicians is a democratic imperative. It is clearly, again, in the public interest that publications be held account, politicians be held accountable for their actions, including the, their misdemeanors, if any. Indeed, our system of government requires, if not depends upon, our elected representatives being accountable. Thirdly, to hold their representatives accountable, it's important that citizens are fully informed. Thus, it is in the public interest that people be informed as to what their elected representatives are actually doing, in contrast to what they may tell us they are doing. In other words, it is in the public interest that those in power should not be in a position to control or manipulate the information we, the people, receive. Fourthly, Citizens in a democracy are also to be, be enti are entitled to be treated with respect. They are citizens of a democracy. And it is in the public interest that such citizens should not be subject to personal attacks and vilified for political ends. <coughs> Fifthly, nor should government be free from criticism. That again is part of the democratic process. And it is in the public interest that citizens who wish to be critical of the government are not intimidated to the point of being fearful or hesitant about speaking out. And sixthly, 
It is not in the public interest to vest power in the hands of outside people like Cameron Slater. As stated in the subtitle to Dirty Politics, attack politics should not be permitted to poison New Zealand's political environment. It is not in the public interest. not in the public interest that any politician, and certainly not the Prime Minister, should be regularly presenting a persona to the public which is at odds with the dirty politics happening under his watch within his office. <laughs> now it's not good enough to say, as has been said regularly, that all parties are doing it, but this is politics, get used to it. First, even if true, such a claim does not make the use of a rogue blogger as part of a systematic <coughs> and coordinated political strategy to denigrate and possibly destroy political opponents and others acceptable. Two wrongs do not make a right. Secondly, it is simply not true. All parties are not doing it. Briefing the media and leaking information, even adverse snippets about one's opponents, is not of the same order as incorporating a vicious blog, blogger in a systematic and coordinated campaign or strategy. To denigrate, discredit, and destroy people seen as, quote, the enemy, unquote. Political tricks are not the thing same as dirty political tricks. Politics is not the same as dirty politics. In effect, absent the bullets, the Prime Minister's office was hiring a hitman to do their dirty work. And that is not in the public interest. Now, for all these reasons, I believe that the public interest had to prevail. Nikki Hager acted responsibly and ethically in using the emails that came into his possession to write this book. Indeed, I consider that it would have been remiss for him, both as a citizen and as an investigative journalist, not to have drawn them to the public's attention and, and to have done so in the most effective way possible. Nicky Hager tells me that his, dress does, his address tonight does not have a title, but that he, he will talk about his book. I hope, as a result of what he said, he will talk as a person who is a responsible and ethical investigative journalist. Nicky Hager. through the media, I talk in public to people, and thank you very much for coming. I'm going to talk about um, the reaction to the book, I'm going to talk about some of what's in it for the people who haven't read it, I'm going to talk about what I think needs to be done about it, and then, probably most important, or most interesting, um, I'm, I'm happy to front up and answer any questions or challenges or anything that wants, anyone wants to ask about the book, and we'll try to spend plenty of the time on that. Um, so this is my sixth book that I've written, and they've all done reasonably well, but there has never been a book which has had a reaction like this before. And I don't think that's about my writing style. I think there's something about the content of this that has struck a nerve in New Zealand political being, that, that it's actually resonated with something that was going on for people who are living and thinking about politics in New Zealand. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, it could seem, if you, if you haven't read the book, or it might seem if you've um, heard about it through the news media, as if the, book, as if the book was kind of a compendium of nastiness and um, of dirty things and deception. 
But as far as I'm concerned, it's really a book about ethics. It's about who we want to be as a country and the choices that political people have to make. And so that's why I'm going to, in a little while, I'm going to talk about the things which I think are how we deal with the stuff which is in the book rather than just wallowing around in the, the nastiness of it. <clears throat> the thing is that what I wrote about wasn't, mostly wasn't new news. I think that's the important part of it. I think there were people all over the country. I know there were people all over the country who had been feeling attacked or frightened or intimidated or um, got at by the, by the scale of attack politics that's been going on. I personally know people inside the world of science and academia and other areas who have been threatened and pressured through their jobs not to speak out in the public interest. So that we've had a political environment in recent years where the people who you would most like to be speaking on issues often feel constrained or, or, or um, frightened of doing that, you know, vulnerable when they do that. At the same time, the political parties have been experiencing, the opposition political parties, have been experiencing repeated minor scandals, smears, attacks, seemingly you know, coming from nowhere, um, controversies, many of which, from my research and from the papers I found, had been orchestrated in a banal and easy way, using the same tricks over and over again by this attack machine, which had been set up over the last eight years within the National Party. So I think lots of people had already been feeling that and they've been uncomfortable with it. And that's one of the reasons why there's been such a strong reaction to the book. And the other thing I think people have been feeling is something which there wasn't a name for, but it's what the US Republican Party calls a two-track approach to public opinion, wooing public opinion or winning public opinion. And before I just run through some details of the book, I want to talk about the two-track approach because it's kind of... It's, in a way, it's a central idea of, of the book, and I think it's a central idea about how politics has been working in New Zealand. And I should say where this idea came from. When I finished my book, The Hollow Man, which I worked on much longer than the current one and I'm proud of, I got an email from one of the people who was in, in the book. Um, he, he was, he'd been involved in a meeting with the exclusive brethren in Hawke's Bay when Don Brash was there and wrote to me about it, being New Zealand, his, I know his uncle, of course, <laughs> we're all related, and um, he said, this, my mate said to me, could you get hold of my nephew, he's in, in your book and he wants to talk about it with you. And it was a man called Simon Lusk. And he wanted to tell me, he, wanted, he was actually interested in the book and the ideas, and wanted to tell me his views and his findings on negative politics, which he'd been finding from studying the American uh, Republican Party. And so this is, this is, some of you will know this from the book, but it's central to it, which is why I want to say it for any other people, for people here who haven't read it. And then this, this is the idea that negative politics is a very powerful kind of politics. You can trip up, you can smear, you can damage your opponents. And the United States is the place where this has been, you know, practiced the most, developed the most in their political system. But the problem with negative politics is it can backlash on the candidate that's doing it. That you can look bad, you might look like a person who does really horrible, dirty politics, if you're doing, seen doing it. And so what the two-track policy was that was, de that was devised and, and developed within the US Republican Party politics was that the leaders, or the leader, would be held above the dirty politics, the smears, the personal attacks, the, the nastiness, and be positive and relaxed, while, the, they would contract out at to arm's length the people who were producing the negative attack ads and digging out the dirt and the smears and so on. But digging inside your political opponent's um, you know, organisation and taking out information and using it in targeted political attacks is very Nixonian is what I'm saying. This is, this is off the scale of what we're used to in this country. And I note that the Prime Minister has still not in any way answered or taken responsibility for it. But then we move on to a new stage of this, which I did not expect to find, and I don't think anyone was particularly expecting. And that is that the same machine which had been set up for attacking people 
he stuck their heads up in politics and political parties, which were the opponents of the National Party, was being used for commercial clients as well. And this is an insidious thing that's been going on. There have been whole political issues and whole controversies which have been run with the use of the whale oil blog and an echo to a sister blog, Kiwi blog, with stuff written by unseen people and paid for by large New Zealand corporates who should be deeply embarrassed for having done something so scummy. And that, that's an issue which will not be resolved between now and the election. In fact, I would suggest that over the next few years, we should be unpicking and talking about those politics because it's extremely disreputable and it will take a while to hold people for it to account and to produce change about that. There's also, the, just jumping through the last things, there's also the chapters about phony political campaigns, which is really about the news media and all the rest of us not being so susceptible to, 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 to the next person who jumps up and says, I'm an independent group who's campaigning for, you know, against the MMP or whatever. But in fact, it's the same few National Party activists running campaigns that suit their party. And then the final area, of course, which is kind of the grubbiest of all, but is very serious, is the use of personal sexual kind of scandals, which, which we had already seen in the Len Brown case, organised by the Auckland National Party, but which there were many other examples of. And actually was, was a, a, not just a means of attacking people, but what became clear listening to Cameron Slater and others talking about it was a way of getting control over other people because they were in fear. And while I've travelled in the last two weeks talking to people about the book and talk, doing a lot of new media interviews, I've been taken aside by various journalists, senior and otherwise. This is an important story, and it will just not just it's only because I've been having to see journalists mostly, who have said to me, um, Nikki, was there anything about me and that information? <laughs> which, which of course is funny, but it's not funny. It's actually terrible. Because all over the country, all of us, everyone has got things that they're embarrassed about. Everybody thinks things that they're stupid and not proud of. Let's, we know, let's not be high and mighty about it. And if you think that there's an industry out there, a maliciously directed industry of people digging that up and saving it to use against you. This is a very, very destructive influence to have happen in a little society like ours. And I'm saying, I've, in a short time, I have met quite a few people who have been nervous about that phenomenon. It's really, really grubby. So I want to say a little bit, oh, I want to say one final thing about the principles, which I think you'll understand, but, but, but we need to get new ideas in our head for understanding these kind of people. And the thing that, uh, at the end, when I finished the Holy Men, it struck me that, that the tactics I had been writing about were how you win over people who aren't naturally your supporters, or how you kind of trick people to support you when actually they might be voting against their own interests. But what I saw in this book and actually heard from the people concerned and saw in the literature that they believe in and quote was a new kind of way of doing politics. And that's not the politics of political campaigners or political management people who are trying to win voters over to their party. This is the politics of trying to stop people voting, of people giving up, of pushing people out of politics. And I think that is actually the uniting theme of what this book is about. The book is about all the people who have been silenced or scared or bullied into being less vocal members of, of our society. And it's also about the people who have, have been encouraged to see politics as a dirty, grubby, selfish game where all the politicians are as bad as each other and the whole thing's useless and just turn up your music and don't take any notice and don't vote. Which is a really dangerous and terrible thing. And it's also a horribly expedient thing because they know exactly who's going to stop voting first and it's not their people they think. So these are serious policies for us, and if we don't understand what they're thinking and where they're coming from, we don't know what the answers are. And I'm going to talk about the answers in just a minute, but I just, Ted did this very well for me, but I just want to say something about, about the issue of privacy, because I have been quite reasonably, I think, and also quite um, 
you know, I'm just trying to find an argument to divert off the issues. But I have been challenged about, about why me, who often talks about privacy and people's rights for privacy, think it's all right to, to, leak, to take leaked information. Good question, reasonable challenge. First thing I'd say is that leaking, just understanding what a leak is. A leak is a safety valve in society. A leak means something which is unauthorised or illegal or regarded as wrong to get out. It's not the normal process. You don't get leaks under the Official Information Act. Leaking is what you do when something important is going on which is not going to be found out about otherwise. So I'm, I believe in leaks, but I believe they have to have a very good reason. Ted's talked about that. But there's privacy in it. So when, I, so when somebody leaks me, when someone comes to me and lets me use a part, this pile of information about the, the weird world of Cameron Slater and all his associates, I feel a very strong obligation to just compartmentalise my mind and not use most of that. And what I'm saying is, I believe that even in the act of dealing with a leak like this, privacy is just as important. And I went to huge lengths to take people's names out, to cut out the dirty bits, to use little bits of quotes and not other bits so that I didn't humiliate people, not cause them problems with their families and the rest of it. And I think that's, I just want to say this because I don't want to seem to have been a hypocrite by my stand in one area and my stand in another. Thank you. And I want to illustrate this by making reference to a mistake that happened, which is that I was challenged to release some of the information from the book by uh, the Prime Minister, saying that I'd made it up and he, I had to front up or he wouldn't, people wouldn't believe me. So I spoke to my source, who was a, a decent and ethical person, and said, would you release some of the documents that, uh, that you gave to me that I used for the book? And in one of those cases, he released information without taking out the personal data, which really hurt and upset somebody, whose name I won't repeat here to um, increase the crime. But I just want to say I'm sorry, and that man had every reason to be angry and upset, and we just all have to be more careful, because these, these, privacy matters hugely in society for people's rights, and, I, and I'm sorry that happened. The final thing I want to talk about, which is maybe the most important part, is what can be done. I start from the point of view that I don't believe for a moment that politics is inevitably awful and shabby and bad and selfish and all those things that we sometimes hear. Um, but it will be if we leave it to people who were featured in my book. What can we do? Um, the first one is to accept the inevitability. You can't stop politicians being tricky or telling lies. You can't stop PR people trying to manipulate things. You can't stop, you can't legislate against dirty tricks, basically, in most ways. So what you have to do if you don't want the kind of stuff which I document in the book is to build up society's defences and empower other people to participate in politics so it's different. This is not a wussy answer, this is the strongest answer there is. This is why in the final part of the book, in the afterword, I list all the things which I think will improve the public interest strong, democratic kind of politics in this country. And these issues won't be sorted out between now and the next election, but they're actually much more important than the next election. These are things which I urge you to read and think about and help to, help to bring into being over the coming years, because otherwise we leave the field to the nastiest and the most unscrupulous people to determine the way politics are done in our country. The second thing... Yeah. The second thing I want to say is that um, everyone can help. If I write a book and it causes a stir in the news media and then the stir dies down, well, frankly, that was just like another bit of political entertainment as the years roll by. Um, and I want to talk about what everyone can do. I, I believe that involvement in politics, is <coughs> that, that even when there are people who are being unscrupulous in politics, politics is, is the sum of the actions of everyone involved. And the more people who try to do good things, the better it is, it is for the whole country. So what do you do? Well, first of all, please help to try to build up our, our news media resources and our transparency and those defences that we can have. Um, but the next thing I would say is, don't imitate the attack bloggers. 
If you have a left-wing blog, don't make it like a right-wing blog. Don't think that, that, that because they've been affected that that's the way to do politics. In fact, look at what they're doing and reject it, is what I would argue, strongly. Um, <laughs> so as I say, the answer to dirty politics is for every person who possibly can to act in the way that they think that politics should be. I also want to say I believe in books. I actually think there's a difference between books and news media. I think there's something about people reading from one end of a book to another which can actually change things. And so I'm asking you quite specifically, if you think that the book is worthwhile, tell people about it. Lend them the copy. Encourage it out there. Because books, I know from my experience of years of writing them, the books have an, have an effect far beyond the relatively small numbers that get printed. But please help that process. And this is the, this is the fastest selling book my publishers have ever had. It's going to go a long way. I hope it to go farther, please. Um, and of course, the final thing is, understand, this is for individuals, understand what the politics are we're fighting. We're fighting the politics of encouraging people not to participate. And the answer to that is to participate. Participate in writing and thinking and talking and being involved in elections. That's actually the antidote. That's the answer. That's the flip side of what we're talking about. It's participation. Participation in the National Party. I don't mind participation in the Labour Party. Participation in the other parties. But participation is the answer to the politics that we're talking about. And if you don't belong to anything, then at least the least you can do and it's not very little, and it's not just small, is have a big party at your place on election day and invite all your strange relatives who say they can't be bothered voting, and invite everybody and take them all down to the polling booth and you'll feel good about it and then we go on to greater powers. <laughs> and, and, and forget Cameron Slater. Cameron Slater has been used and he's a tool in these politics, but the story is not really about him. I want to name the two enemies which I see of clean and good politics in this country. And one of them is cynicism and the other one is pessimism. Cynicism is where we, where we believe the people who say everyone does it, all politicians are the same, they're self-serving, they've got their snouts in the trough and the rest of it. I don't believe that. I just don't think it's true. The other thing, and pessimism, is feeling that it's all hopeless and everything gets worse, which is what it looks like when you look at the bad things which happen in society, but you forget to look at all the good ones. I don't feel cynical. I think that most people in our country have really good values and care about the things. I think that's why I can write a book like this and it resonates so strongly. And I don't feel pessimistic, because my whole life has showed me that things are better when we bother to speak up about what we believe in. And the main thing I want to say, as I said at the beginning, I'm just about finished, I promise. Um, the main thing I want to say is that what I said at the beginning is this is not, I don't want, I, I did not want to write a book about sleaze and slime. I believe it's a book about ethics. And what a book about ethics means is that if you read it, and if we talk about the issues, and if we look at expediency versus principle, and how we treat each other, and what it's like to be fair versus what it's worth to just be pragmatic and, and um, play dirty tricks and things, we can decide what values we want to build our society on. And that what I'm really saying is that what I would hope when people read this is that they look at it, and they see the choices are there, and they choose what side they want to be on, whether the good politics or the dirty politics and what we're going to do about it to change it.